Hello, I'm Dr. Daniel Podolsky, president of UT Southwestern Medical Center. Dr. Donald Selden is an icon of American academic medicine. He was a medical pioneer when he left Yale in 1951 to come to UT Southwestern, which at the time was not even 10 years old. Ever since, the history of this institution has been closely intertwined with Dr. Selden's vision and leadership. During his 36 years as chairman of the Department of Internal Medicine, he shaped UT Southwestern through his faculty recruitments and the education and training of literally thousands of medical students and residents, many of whom have gone on to become leaders in their academic fields. Dr. Selden is widely revered as one of the greatest chairs of internal medicine in American medical history, and he is often rightly characterized as the intellectual father of UT Southwestern Medical School. I hope you enjoy this retrospective of Dr. Selden's life and career, which are virtually synonymous with the development of UT Southwestern as a premier academic medical center. In January 1951, a 30-year-old doctor from Yale University arrived in Dallas with his wife and young daughter to take a job, sight unseen, at a small fledgling medical college. He was shocked at what he saw. Having trained at one of the leading academic medical centers in the U.S. with superb facilities. Yet, he would stay in Dallas, build a life, a career, and one of the world's great academic medical centers. In the process, he would transform the teaching of medicine in Texas, bring world-class medical care to Dallas, and help establish North Texas as a leading venue for groundbreaking biomedical research. This is the story of Donald W. Selden of UT Southwestern Medical Center, a man who has been called one of the dominant intellectual forces in American medicine. Don Selden was the triple threat. He was an outstanding scientist, bench and bedside. He was a, an astute clinician committed to the best in patient care and he administered a division and a department uh, as few others have. Uh, Dr. Goldstein would tell me that Dr. Selden was the most brilliant person he'd ever met, that he, his knowledge of medicine was encyclopedic, that he was exciting, that he was a very tough taskmaster and uh, very demanding of his residents and students. He described him as a whirlwind. And once I met Selden, I realized um, Joe wasn't exaggerating. Anybody who comes in contact with him, I think you'll hear pretty much the, the same thing, that he really is a man with great class. He's dashing eloquence as a zestful life, irrepressible, sometimes exhausting. <laughs> Intense, exacting, passionate. energetic, critical. He was always the authority, <laughs> whoever was the dean or the president, before I was dean or president and after. Uh, but he also was not only the leader of his team, but he was a team player. To sort of take a historical perspective, I think that there are two people in modern medicine, I would say modern medicine, began um, about 150 years ago. Uh, I think the first one was William Osler. He was a great physician. He was a keen observer. He was an extraordinary teacher. He created a medical school, Johns Hopkins. And I think the uh, a person who is his equal in terms of impact would be Donald Selden. He has an extremely restless mind. In other words, he wants to know how things are and he is extremely well read and he asks questions and he, he's just curious whether it is uh, history or whether it is politics or whether it is art or whether it is the importance, as we say, of various composers or whether it's an economic issue. He just has a curious mind. I've often thought that he's, and this is hands down true, he's the most remarkable man I've ever met.
It is unlikely that Donald Selden could have foreseen where life would eventually take him. Born in 1920 in Coney Island, New York, he grew up there in modest circumstances. His father, a dentist, lost much of the family's money during the Great Depression, leaving them struggling to make ends meet. He did, however, encourage his son to follow scholarly pursuits. In high school, Selden began to read extensively and developed an interest in literary works, economics, political science, and philosophy. Though Selden describes himself as a mediocre student, he graduated from high school at just 16 years old, having skipped grades. He secured a scholarship and enrolled at Washington Square College in New York City. Selden did well, majoring in literature, but in his senior year, he began taking biology and chemistry courses with the idea that he would attend medical school after graduation. Selden was accepted by Yale School of Medicine, enrolling there in 1940 at the age of 20. At Yale, he would come under the influence of Dr. John Peters, head of the section of metabolism in the Department of Internal Medicine. Peters, considered a giant in American medicine, deeply impressed Selden with his learning, scholarship, and dedication to medicine. In 1948, Peters offered Selden a position as an instructor of medicine at Yale. Selden accepted, and he and wife Muriel began a period that Selden would later describe as, as great a time as I've ever had. But the Department of Medicine was staffed with many bright physicians in the years immediately after World War II and Selden realized it might be years, if ever, before he got a chance at a leadership position. He would stay for three years until an obscure medical school in Dallas came calling. Selden accepted a position as an associate professor of medicine at Southwestern Medical School without ever having visited Dallas or the ramshackle seven-year-old school an event he recalled more than 60 years later. I was uh, offered a position here by Dr. Charles Burnett. Now, I was also rather naive, and I never came to Dallas to see physically what the place was like. He, we corresponded, we met once or twice, but I never came to Dallas. And when I finally agreed to come, I arrived here and I stopped at Oak Lawn Avenue and Maple and asked an attendant where Southwestern Medical School was. And he gestured in a vague direction toward a railway overpass and indicated that the school was beside it. There I went and all I found was a bunch of shacks with garbage on the floor behind a uh, decayed brick building. And I didn't see anything that looked like a medical school. So I went back to the gas station attendant and I said, uh, I went where you indicated and all I saw was garbage and a bunch of shacks. And he said, that's it, that's the medical school. For Selden, the small Dallas medical school with no long history or tradition offered an opportunity to be innovative, to start new things and new programs, and to instill a sense of his personal style into a program. His professor at Yale, the, when he was recruited here, thought that he was making a terrible mistake. And he told him, he came to Texas, he, he would have no good students. And that irritated Selden, and Selden decided to prove him wrong. <laughs> it would not be an easy task. In April 1951, just four months after Selden arrived in Dallas, he received some surprising news from his boss, Dr. Charles Burnett, the man who had recruited him to Southwestern. I uh, went into his office once to tell him that I had been selected to present the paper at Atlantic City. At that time, it was a high honor. Uh, he congratulated me, but indicated that he had an offer from North Carolina, and in two months he was gone. The only faculty member besides Selden departed with him, leaving Selden the only remaining full-time member of the Department of Medicine. Selden seriously considered leaving as well, 
but he decided to stay and accepted the chairmanship of the Department of Medicine. He was 31 years old. This wasn't a sumptuous crowning of any sort. There was nobody else around. Selden soon went about implementing his vision of a department of scholars where the practice of medicine and the pursuit of scientific discovery would advance simultaneously. It was Selden's vision that you couldn't have a medical school without good basic science. But there would be difficulties. Money was extremely tight, making it difficult to secure adequate equipment and recruit first-rate faculty. To solve the problem of recruiting quality faculty on a limited budget, he devised an ingenious plan. The major resource we had was students. And so it seemed to me that if we were ever going to do anything at that time, we should take advantage of the students. And it turned out that the students were ultimately as good as anybody in the world. Some of them became world famous. Well, part of his methodology when he was building up the department was he would see promising people and send them off and then bring them back on the faculty uh, here. He did that with Goldstein, Gene Wilson, myself, Norman Kaplan. The only time I was away was when I went to do fellowship at the National Institutes of Health. And I really wasn't planning to come back here. Selden was very persuasive. The strategy, as I would call it, which is would certainly be long-term, not short-term, would be to recognize students, help them figure out what may be something that they could do that would bring something new to the new medical school in Dallas, and then go away, learn that, then come back. And then once you come back, then you have to be supported to get your research career off the ground. So that would be the Selden strategy. Those of us who were coming to Southwestern in those days, usually we had been trained in what were decent, but not uh, academically uh, high-powered uh, institutions. We were almost all Texans who had gone to public schools in Texas and gone to Texas universities and gotten a good solid grounding but uh, had a lot to learn and uh, he had a lot to teach. The list of students he would recruit under the program would include many who would become noteworthy in their fields and the foundation for the future excellence of UT Southwestern. The people that Don Selton attracted and persuaded to stay became the heart and soul of the institution. When you look at his track record for identifying students and residents, sending them away and bringing them back with a specific job in mind, I can't imagine anyone has nearly as good a record. All of them came back because of a personal commitment to him. Eventually, as the school and the budget grew, he would supplement his homegrown talent with leading physician scientists from outside Southwestern, such as Morris Ziff, a renowned rheumatologist from NYU, and Marvin Sipperstein, a cholesterol metabolism expert from the National Institutes of Health. He had a um, tremendous amount of optimism about the school, optimism about um, uh, clinical investigation, in, uh, in, uh, in medicine and uh, the developments that were happening in medicine. I mean, he exuded that. It was easy for me to see how uh, that he was really a Pied Piper um, and would attract people and would attract the best people. I have said that one of Don Selden's wonderful qualities is he has the best taste in academic horse flesh of uh, anyone who's been around in the last half century. Within just 10 years, the Department of Internal Medicine had grown in size and prominence, propelled by Selden's insistence on excellence and his development of a first-rate faculty built on a three-part model. I always imagined that a medical school had at its basis a command of biomedical science. Now this sounds rather cold and abstract, but biomedical science is not the whole of medicine, it's just the basis of medicine. 
So the image of the medical school that at least seemed to me sort of noble was to cultivate an institution which was rooted in biomedical science, but also made contact with patients who were suffering with humane dignity. Now, uh, that meant that the individuals who were on the faculty should have a command of science, of research, of teaching, and of clinical work. And this trifold responsibility was very difficult. Nevertheless, nevertheless, that was the model. It was an approach to medicine that influenced others outside Southwestern as well. He also had a, a major effect in academic medicine because many of the outstanding figures in academic medicine, like Bob Petersdorf at the University of Washington in Seattle, Gene Brownwald at the Peter Brent Brigham Hospital, and many other people uh, were influenced by his ideas and that they apply, and they were applied in their department. I tried very hard to get people to line up their research activities with their clinical activities so that they wouldn't be leading very separate lives, so that each activity strengthened the other one. If you're doing research in an area, it should make you a better doctor in that field. If you are a very good doctor in that field, it should help you frame questions that you can answer in your laboratory. Seems pretty obvious, but it wasn't obvious to a lot of people. He's a very thorough and very methodical thinker, and I think he therefore is, is rather rigorous and has, has made many contributions by really going at the bottom of, of a phenomenon, of an interaction, and he's not uh, satisfied with, uh, with, uh, with superficial answers. The astonishing growth and momentum that Selden ignited in the 1950s and 60s carried over into the 1970s at Southwestern, where Selden's approach to medicine produced a stimulating environment. It was the most exciting place in the world. Uh, there were superstars walking all over the place, young and upcoming, and Dr. Selden was the uh, leader of it all. And, and so it was uh, intimidating, but intimidating in a good way. You expected to be there at dawn and frequently work till late at night. He was bubbling with ideas in and out of the laboratory. In medicine, there are two ways to win an argument, a clinical argument inductive and the deductive logic. If you were at the Mass General where I trained and you had an argument with somebody about whether a patient had a particular disease, you would go out and find the, the, per, the article that studied the most patients with that disease. And you'd find out, yes, in order to have that diagnosis, you should have these six different criteria and all of that. It was all inductive reasoning. It was reasoning from experience. In Dallas, you didn't argue that way. In Dallas, you argued by first principles. You said, okay, if this heart is not working properly, it means that it's not getting enough oxygen. And what does oxygen do? Oxygen causes uh, mitochondria to work. So the point is, it was all the arguments, which there were many, were all based on physiology. He uh, presided over his department and built his department and encouraged the faculty in a, in a remarkable way that won not only uh, a loyalty but uh, earned for everybody, including Dr. Selden, a team spirit uh, that made them want the entire department and the entire school to succeed. So rather unusually in academic medicine, uh, everybody was rooting for each other rather than trying to find a, the best place for themselves. He never had a hidden agenda. Everything that he did, you knew, was for the good of the department and for the school. You never felt that he was somehow manipulating things or playing one person off against another or anything like that. Magical is the best adjective to describe it. The whole atmosphere was just magical. And it was driven by him. Let me tell you how I first met Don Selden. I was a 30-year-old, a young research fellow 
in what I would say was the rival laboratory to the Selden Rector Laboratory in Dallas. Early in my second year of fellowship, I obtained results from an experiment that was similar to an experiment that had been uh, carried out in Dallas and published. My results differed, starkly differed. Instead of just going ahead and publishing the paper, I insisted, boldly perhaps, that we first show the data to Rector and Selden. And Selden basically hugged me and said, you've given us the greatest courtesy of showing us your results before you published it and letting us see for ourselves why you think there's a difference in results. And he instantly conveyed a sense to me of an individual whose concern was more about learning and advancing and not about the biases and the competitions and the other nonsense that often goes on. The faculty, for its part, was devoted to Selden. Many describe a magnetic, intense man with extraordinary clinical knowledge and demanding standards. But he was also known to have a compassionate side and was steadfast in his dedication to teaching and research. He was tough, I mean, but we all sort of adored him. And he would come out uh, in, in the middle of the night, you know, we'd call him and he, he he would come over and see a patient at 3 o'clock in the morning and then start giving a lecture there. He wanted me to introduce genetics lectures into the curriculum for the junior and senior students. I was thrilled to have this opportunity. And the entire summer, July and August, and part of September, I spent working on two lectures. So just as the lecture was ready to start, Selden came in and sat down right in front of me. If you knew Selden, he has a, a very peculiar tick when he really doesn't like something. He says it by taking off his glasses and pinching his nose. Well, just a few minutes into my lecture, he had taken off his glasses and pinched his nose. And right after that, he simply put his head down on his arms down on the desk and spent the rest of the hour shaking his head. When the lecture was over, he came up, he put his left arm around my right arm, and pulled me to the blackboard, he picked up a piece of chalk, and he regave that lecture as he would have given it. And it was a painful teaching experience, but I appreciated the fact he wanted me to be a good teacher. So I gave a talk on, on this great breakthrough, which I thought was fantastic, and uh, Dr. Selden just sort of sat there, and afterwards, um, by that time, when it was over, it was probably about seven o'clock in the evening, um, he immediately ushered me into his office and said, now listen, that was a terrible talk. <laughs> Let me show you. And he took all my slides that I had used and rearranged them in a much more logical order and threw out things that were irrelevant and um, and we were there till about nine o'clock. In fact, his wife, Muriel, called up to find out what was, he had missed his supper. But, you know, that was the kind of person he was. And I, here I was, just a young fellow, really. When I was about halfway through my chief residency, he sat me down and asked me what I was gonna do with my life. And I said that I thought I was going to be a practicing endocrinologist. And he told me, just shook his head, no, this is not what you should do. You, this is not going to sustain you. And he said, yes, I think you should be a, a scientist, and I think you should train in the Brown and Goldstein Laboratory. He said, this is really critical. You need to train in the very best place. And just like it was really important for you to train in a good place as a doctor, you need to train in a, a, a great place um, if you're going to be a scientist. And so, I went into the lab. I, of course now, so happy that I did because it has been such a great career for me. Yet his teaching methods could also be a harsh challenge to those who fell short. As one former colleague has said, 
He was intolerant of the illogical or poorly formed argument, the disorganized lecture, pedestrian research, and indifferent patient care. Many generations of students were told, here's a dime, go call your mother. She will know the answer to my question. Tell her you are coming home. Well, those are sort of standard lines that he had for all the students and things about, yeah, go call your mother, and what would your mother think about that? But I'm sure he has a whole recitation of those sort of things, and, and, and you know, they would liven up a, a lecture and so forth. His reputation was that he was incredibly smart, that he was extremely demanding of excellence, and that he would accept nothing else. And when you weren't up to his speed or when you did something that he considered to be stupid, he wasn't bashful about telling you so. And the worst thing in the world you ever wanted was for him to accurately tell you that that was a dumb thing to do. Dr. Selden is a very direct person. He would ask you very pointed questions and you either knew the answer or you didn't. And if you didn't know the answer, you had to get comfortable saying, I don't know. Because if he caught you trying to figure out a way not to answer the question, but you know, talk a lot, he just would not put up with it. And I really liked his ability to ask tough questions and not make it personal. It wasn't about you as a person. It was about the patient. He told me in later years that he never really criticized people that he thought couldn't stand it. He only criticized the people that he thought were tough enough to stand it. But I don't think that's true. <laughs> I, think he, I think he found out he was tough enough to stand it. Ex post facto. <laughs> you got this distinct, strong feeling that he cared. He wasn't pushing you just to be mean and just to be king of the hill. Uh, he was pushing us because he saw something in us that uh, if we really worked hard, we could uh, make something of ourselves. He saw more good things in me than I would have thought there was to see. Selden's message was not always biting. He was, as one colleague said, lavish in his praise of the clever or novel idea, the ingenious experiment, the scholarly lecture, the extraordinary effort expended in the care of a seriously ill patient. Selden had a warm side too. He and wife Muriel raised three children in Dallas, two daughters and a son. And in a sense, his faculty, residents and fellows were like family. He liked to take the student fellows out to lunch. He had a, a car. It was sold by Sears and Roebuck during World War II, and it was a very insecure car, sort of tinny, and it was a menace when he was driving it. Selden often hosted parties for faculty and residents at his home, featuring skits and plays. And in later years, he appeared in student-made video productions in which he would play prominent roles. Uh, for decades, the senior students would do a senior film. And it was a satire on life at UT Southwestern, at Parkland, and becoming a doctor. The star of the film almost every year was Don Selden, because he could be counted on to let his hair down and do the silliest, craziest nonsense that the students asked him to do for the film. I'm Captain James T. Kirk, commanding the Starship Enterprise. Ah, uh, Captain, I am the Don. Can you tell me the status of my crew? All of your men were beamed aboard and are in good condition, except for one. Apparently there was a malfunction in Caster 5, and the man is severely brain damaged. No, Captain. There's been no malfunction. That's baseline for Dr. Pierce. Acting, it turns out, is just one of many talents and interests that Selden possesses. By all accounts, he has an almost encyclopedic knowledge of a broad range of subjects. You can throw anything on the table, and he's got a better working knowledge of it than a lot of people who consider themselves experts. I don't care whether it's the Cowboys, or baseball, or art, or music, uh, uh, just right down the line. He's a brilliant individual. When you go to his house, he has 
beautiful art at his house. And every single piece has a story and a story behind it of why this piece? Why did he pick this piece and not another? You've heard about all of his famous expeditions to restaurants and all of his liking good food, so forth. In fact, whenever he gets to heaven, I'm sure that uh, St. Peter will hear a complaint that the food is terrible. Don Selden likes everything. And he knows a lot about everything. He had his own opinions about what symphonies were the best and whether opera was as high an art form as a string quartet, and you could go on and on and on. It was never dull to be around Don Self. He's very interested in, in, in all sorts of music, primarily classical music and, and opera. On one occasion, I heard uh, an aria, and I asked him, I said, I heard the so-and-so uh, aria, uh, do you know that one? And he looked at me in all seriousness, and he says, oh yes, do you want to hear it in German or Italian? You know, <laughs> I think he could have done it. <laughs> He's a, just a voracious reader. This is the one that he has just recently finished. This has to do with the years between 1933 and 1939. So this is the kind of stuff that he likes to read when he is at home. But there was time for relaxation as well. Selden loves to dance. He taught dancing briefly as a young man, and for many years, he has been a devoted fan of professional football. But even then, it's hard to separate the intensity and passion from the man. Not only does he like professional football, but if it's a really close game or a team that he cares about, he gets right up in front of the television. He starts talking to the coach. Why did you call that play? Didn't you know that so-and-so was going to do such and such? You should have called such and such. Why couldn't you see it? <laughs> Ellen Selden has been with her husband through many football seasons. A former student at Southwestern and still a physician herself, she married Selden in 1998, four years after the death of his first wife. A music lover, the two had reconnected when she sent him a manuscript for a book she had written about Bach. Her reappearance was perhaps a lifesaver. I think that he did go through a difficult period. Uh, he and Muriel, his first wife, had been the, the best term, and I, I think I've used it, and I've heard others use it as well. I think they were soulmates. They had uh, known each other for many years. They had grown up together in New York. Muriel was a formidable figure intellectually. I think that they were more than simply man and wife, I guess is what I would say. And I think losing her, seeing her struggle and losing her, I think was difficult for him, and I'm not surprised. And then Ellen came into his life, and that obviously I've told Ellen before that I'm not sure he would be alive if it weren't for Ellen. Uh, I think that it was her presence that helped a great deal. One of the reasons probably that we do get along and that our marriage has endured and become stronger is because although I respect him, I don't, I'm not intimidated. And it helps that there are areas in which he has no expertise, such as how to use um, a socket wrench. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's right and simple problems that have to do with plumbing. I understand those. <laughs> In 1987, after 36 years on the job, Selden chose to step down as chair of internal medicine. He had done just about everything he could do, he said, and thought it might be a good time for someone else to take over. It's very difficult to respond to this moving occasion. Uh, I have to say that I'm a loss for words. Uh, nevertheless, uh, that doesn't render me mute. Having been chairman of medicine for 36 years and the dominant figure in the medical school that when he retired from that job, he bowed out very gracefully and didn't impose himself in ways that a lot of people do that have been in power for a long time and so forth. 
I think many people respect that aspect of him. And Selden was succeeded as chair by Daniel Foster, one of his former star students, whom Selden had persuaded years earlier to return to UT Southwestern. He said, uh, if you have any questions and you ask me, uh, and I know the answer, I'll try to tell you. Uh, and if there's something you want me to do, I will do it. But I'm not gonna interfere with your chairmanship. And the whole time I was there for 16 years and uh, he, he, never, he never did that. Though he no longer serves as chair, Selden has not stopped working. Today, in his 90s, he still visits the office daily, mentoring faculty and students who seek the benefit of his wisdom, knowledge, and experience. Every week he's at Medical Grand Rounds, still, every week. After the Grand Rounds, sometimes we walk out together and he will say, that was rubbish. That is completely wrong. And he will tell me why it was wrong and what was the problem. But also, if somebody gives a great talk, he delights in it. That is the wonderful thing about him. Over the course of Selden's distinguished career, he has been the president of seven learned societies, received six honorary degrees, including one from his alma mater, Yale. He has collaborated on the classic textbook about the kidney and been elected to the Institute of Medicine, one of the nation's most esteemed medical societies. An academic college at UT Southwestern has been named for him. I don't think he has had any regrets. I think he thoroughly enjoyed building up something. I mean, he was, he was the driving force of a nascent uh, medical school. His influence and reputation extend far beyond UT Southwestern, leaving a large footprint that has changed the face of medicine. In the early 1960s, um, medical research as we know it today was just beginning. What I would call uh, hypothesis-driven research. Research where people ask a question, they have a hypothesis, and then they um, design an experiment, whether it's in humans, or whether it's in population, or whether it's in single cells, to test that hypothesis. We take that for granted today, and Don was one of the leaders of that. Selden, to my mind, was the greatest chairman in the history of American medicine. He led a school of scholars committed to excellence in research and in clinical care. And through the hierarchy of this group, their students and trainees succeeded throughout the world and brought the highest of standards. So that Selden didn't only have a role in Dallas. His role was international from the very beginning because his students went out and spread the gospel. Don Selden was a great scientist and he made some seminal discoveries in nephrology. Uh, he was a masterful clinician. He's just been able to uh, apply very basic principles to clinical medicine. I am much more limited, in other words, to basic science pursuits, whereas he uses these principles and applies it to, to patient care and an understanding of, of, of disease. It's only been in 50-ish years since we have a, a subspecialty of medicine called nephrology. A major component of this new enterprise was the formation of societies. Selden was an early president, and then an American society of nephrology was formed. And he was also an early president of that. So he was instrumental in helping the field consolidate into definable entities. I would say he is an exceptionalist in the sense he probably can never be cloned. You'll never see a, another Don Selden as a great chairman of a department of medicine in the sense that, you know, we'll probably never see another Babe Ruth as a baseball player or um, Leonard Bernstein as a conductor of an orchestra or Steve Jobs as a entrepreneur in the 
academic medicine arena, I think Selden would be an exceptionalist like these individuals. I can't imagine uh, another Selden. Well, Don Selden has been uh, uh, my role model and uh, my hero since 1961. He embodies uh, the best qualities in people uh, in a variety of ways. And it does come down to being um, uh, really five components. Obviously, the great physician, the inspiring uh, mentor, teacher, and the brilliant scientist. And the fourth component is the leader of people, uh, sometimes subtle and sometimes not so subtle. And then finally, uh, the fifth component, I would say, uh, why he's been my hero is um, that he's the real McCoy. He's, he's the genuine article. I've learned about this great piece of art called The Fountain by um, a famous um, painter and sculptor, Frank Stoa. Dr. Selden admires his work greatly, and, and I thought well, this would be a great thing to honor Dr. Selden and his first wife, Muriel. And so it's now downstairs in the student area. And it turns out to be Frank Stella actually uh, called it the fountain because it was related to Herman Melville's Moby Dick. In chapter 85 of Moby Dick, entitled The Fountain, Herman Melville tells us that white whales like Moby Dick have been spouting all over the sea and, quote, this is Melville now, sprinkling and mystifying the gardens of the deep for millions of years, end of quote. Now, Melville went on to point out that the big white whale, Moby Dick, is both ponderous and profound. And uh, he said, I am convinced that from the heads of all ponderous and profound beings, such as Plato, the devil, Jupiter, Dante, and so on, there always goes up a semi-visible steam while they are in the act of thinking deep thoughts. Melville ends with the image of Moby Dick's head surrounded by a canopy of vapors. And he says, quote, glorified by a rainbow, as if heaven itself had put its seal upon his thoughts. So I think that's a perfect description of Don Self. Couldn't be better. The institution that Selden had such a large hand in shaping is thriving. Crumbling wooden shacks have been replaced with a modern campus. A new 12-story hospital is under construction. Five Nobel Prize winners have been on the faculty, including a 2011 winner. A sixth was trained here. Research funding now tops more than $400 million a year. My own feeling is that uh, this is one of the finest medical schools in the country. I think that its close connection with a county hospital for the care of the sick is a privilege. And I think that the faculty assigned there is doing what people in academic medicine should do. At the same time, there has been no neglect of medical science. I think the model that has grown up here is a sound model. I would argue that if it weren't for him, Southwestern would be an average state medical school. Uh, it wouldn't be playing with the big boys across the country. Well, I think anything that he's done at the school has impacted the city. You know, there are some very, very prominent people, I think, that have come to the medical school through some urging of Dr. Selden. I don't think there's any doubt the accomplishment for which uh, Don Selden will be most revered, and, and correctly so, is his coming to a poor, little, unknown school and from nothing building a department that was one of the great departments of internal medicine in the world uh, in a very remarkably short period of time, and with that as the springboard, using it as the basis for building one of the great medical centers in the world. When future generations of young physicians arrive in Dallas, perhaps with their own families in tow, they will know the name and reputation of UT Southwestern Medical Center.
and benefit from the legacy of Donald W. Selden. So in response to the question, what did Selden mean to the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School? I am reminded of the line by Ralph Waldo Emerson. An institution is often the lengthened shadow of but one man. He's the man.